I'm very happy to uh, welcome everybody to this conference dedicated to the theme of between the EU and Russia. And it's done in collaboration with the Bear Network, uh, co-led by uh, Juliet Johnson, my colleague who will introduce that network and say a few other things in a moment. Um, just from the perspective of Ponars, let me just say that uh, you know Ponars, um, you can find out more about it at ponarseurasia.org, um, is a network of over 140 scholars uh, now based uh, uh, North America, post-Soviet countries, uh, as well as other parts of Europe. And um, the idea is sort of twofold, part to help build community among specialists who are working uh, on this part of the world in these parts of the world, uh, especially in, in the, in the post-Soviet region, um, but also to help try to um, sort of unlock the research findings that these scholars are doing um, for broader consumption, um, in particular uh, policymakers, but also just people who are thinking and trying to keep informed of um, uh, about events in, in the region. So um, we're excited to bring you the, the conference today. The, uh, the theme, I think maybe Julia could talk a little bit more about that too. Um, but I think the idea in, in particular here is to foster discussion. So in terms of format, we've asked um, speakers to keep their remarks to no more than uh, 10 minutes. And um, yeah, just so you know, uh, people have prepared, like the speakers have prepared short written briefs so that a discussant um, could then comment on them uh, briefly as well. Um, but then we will open things up for uh, broader questions, your own comments and insights. So you know, we look forward to what should be a, a very a vibrant uh, discussion. And I also just want to thank, uh, in particular, uh, GW and its Institute for European, uh, uh, Russian and Eurasian Studies, uh, IRIS, uh, directed by Marlene Laruel, I think is here somewhere. Uh, yes, right there. <laughs> and, um, and the Elliott School of International Affairs here at GW of, uh, GW of which I reach as a part, um, and also Carnegie Corporation of New York, which has been a longtime uh, supporter and, and funder for the Ponar Eurasia program. So um, let me turn things over now to uh, Juliet, who can talk a little bit more about Bear Network and maybe you want to say a little more about the theme uh, of what we want to talk about. And uh, then I look forward to the rest of the discussion. So thank you. Thanks very much, Henry, and thanks again to Ponars Eurasia and to GW for hosting us here. Um, the BEAR Network, BEAR stands for Between the EU and Russia, and then there's a colon after that, Domains of Diversity and Contestation. And this is a Jean Monnet network, so it's, it's funded by the European Commission that combines um, academics in you know, 11 universities across six countries to look at the ways in which um, the relationship and you know, the non-relationship between the EU and Russia affects and is affected by uh, minority politics, uh, national politics, uh, separatist politics, you know, all sorts of different kinds of relationships like this across the areas um, spanning from the EU's eastern border uh, through Russia itself and 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 uh, down into the areas of the former Soviet <coughs> Union. So we were very pleased when uh, when Ponars Eurasia agreed to uh, to co-sponsor this conference with us. Uh, this is a this is in many ways the capstone conference for our Bear Network. We've had previous conferences uh, virtually in uh, in 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 Brussels, uh, led by Marina Kainovu, who's here with us today. Uh, we had a conference in Moscow with our former Bear Network partner, Gimo, no longer a Bear Network partner for obvious reasons, uh, and, uh, and events in Montreal and elsewhere as well. So, uh, so you know, it's, it's, it's under very difficult circumstances that we are all here today, but I think very important ones as well to, uh, uh, to discuss the the ways in which our research can inform policy debates today and policy questions, especially those regarding the ongoing um, aggression of Russia against Ukraine. Uh, so with that, let me introduce our first panel. Uh, our first panel is on Ukrainian society and Russia's full-scale full invasion. Um, David Sagoni will be our chair. I'll be the discussant, so I won't introduce myself. Uh, but I'll let David introduce then 
uh, the rest of the panel and let's get going and have a, a great discussion today. Again, please remember the idea is for is not for us to just sit up here and talk. It's to have it's to have discussion among all panelists and audience members. So keep that in mind. Have your questions ready. Have your comments ready. And uh, and let's have a let's have a good debate. Thanks. Hear me? Good morning. There we go. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming and welcome to the first panel, Ukrainian society and Russia's full scale invasion. We have three talks in person and one virtual. Each will last around 10 minutes and we have 10 minutes for this setup. So yeah, and we're gonna open up for a good half hour of questions both from the audience and from the live web stream. My name is David Ciccone. I'm an assistant professor of political science at GW and associate director of Conar's Eurasia. So let's jump right in with our first presentation. Mikhail Alexia. Um, it should be, let me go see if they are. The Crucible of Freedom, War and Democracy Support in Ukraine. Thanks. And I'll have a two minute card to give you on time. <clears throat> All right, guys. Uh, so a little bit of a um, intro. Let's all say good morning in Ukrainian. Dobro <laughs> haranko. Oh no, no. Let's say it again. Dobro haranko. <laughs> now we're ready to go. Okay. So uh, I uh, we we witnessed a tremendous resilience of Ukrainian society in the face of uh, full scale Russian aggression, from people holding tanks with bare hands to sending Russian warships to where they're supposed to go, to organizing amazing civil society support uh, from bombed cities, to refugee evacuation, to supplying the military, uh, the makings of what the talk will call a society that is preeminently democratic. And yet it was also the talk who warned that the best way to destroy the freedom of democratic nations is war. And so the economist, for instance, in this analysis of uh, the Ukrainian society mobilization and the very identity based on mutual assistance and self-help rather than language, religion, et cetera, warned there will be a risk of backsliding on democracy and liberalism in a country which will be focused on its security as never before. So well, I've been uh, tracking support for democracy in Ukraine with the Ukrainian National Academy of Sciences Institute of Sociology for the last seven years, precisely concerned with that question, uh, noting the war in the Donbass area. And uh, so here's some data to illustrate uh, a response to that question by the economists. So if we um, go here, uh, first of all, uh, well, unfortunately we cannot see, is, is there a way to... Uh, Yeah, so actually, just descriptively, uh, to the question of is democracy uh, important to you personally as a way for Ukraine to develop as a country, uh, we see that if, you, if we average the data before Euromaidan and after Euromaidan uh, and the onset of Crimea, uh, it, it went up and then it kept going up. So the last poll in December 2021 showed even a higher support for democracy. But so that's descriptive. But the interesting thing is when you look at some of the um, data uh, in, a, in a more kind of uh, detailed way, and one of the um, issues was I had uh, an oversample in the Donbass region back in 2017. So we could compare in the Ukrainian government controlled territories uh, respondents who lived where they said they experienced war fighting themselves versus where they didn't. And uh, if we look at that, then remarkably we see uh, that among those who said, yes, I experienced life in the war zone, support for democracy important significantly higher than among others, those who didn't. 
even though in the Donbass region as a whole, democracy support uh, was lower than in the rest uh, of Ukraine. And also, if we look at some of the causes uh, of that support, in the literature, there's, there's a vast academic literature on that showing that personal loss, trauma, stress, uh, the sense of you know, shattered assumptions about peace, incentives to break the rules, the ball of rage, they cause that kind of pro-authoritarian tendency. So uh, the interesting thing too, so yes, those factors were present in the Donbass. Uh, those people who said they were in the war zone also experienced small loss. They lost relatives, friends, homes, jobs, etc. And they experienced more stress. They had war related nightmares and things like that. So, uh, and yet, right, democracy support was stronger. So, uh, another way I would like check with 2021 data very quickly, much smaller, and there, but here is the rally effect. So, in the Donbass, uh, democracy support overall is lower than in the rest of Ukraine in 2021 December poll. But if we look at the war zone within Donbass, then democracy support is higher uh, among those who experienced uh, war action than among those who didn't. And so uh, it, I also pulled the data for three years uh, from 2016 through 2018 to actually get some handle on what may be causing this sort of rallying effect uh, for democracy. Uh, and it's pretty clear that it's the sense of national pride and the perception of Russian aggression. There was that question in those surveys where the people saw the war in the Donbass that started in 2014 as something that was caused by local separatists versus something that was caused by Russia. And if you look at those who thought it was Russia, then support for democracy was tremendously higher. So a lot of other factors, they sometimes are significant, but they can't kind of come out in the wash. And so um, since uh, the idea of Bear is to ask questions about future research, uh, I, I think it actually has some interesting implications. For, for the big implication to me from this uh, is that, uh, well, uh, rallying for a political system rather than the leader is quite possible uh, because Poroshenko's rating uh, declined significantly, and even Zelensky's rating from 19 to 21, but the support kept being strong. But also whether democracy evolves based on domestic issues or whether it's kind of second image reverse, whether it's uh, more a function of geopolitical developments of war and alliances rather than things like uh, education or cultural tradition within a country. Uh, think, for example, and, and it makes us, I guess, ask another question. How does democracy support work around the world? Did we succeed with democracy support in cases like Marshall Plan, Western Europe, East Asia, Japan, Korea, because it was in the frame of confrontation, juxtaposition against the Soviet empire and the Soviet threat. Uh, and that's why perhaps democracy support fails in places where there is no such a geopolitical configuration like the former Soviet republics in Central Asia, for instance, or the Middle East. And so uh, I also uh, think that uh, for Ukraine going forward, there is still a lot of hope. Uh, and so because uh, as the Russian aggression continues uh, and as the society experiences the war, this data suggests that democracy support will stay strong. Uh, and uh, uh, then the question, of course, is uh, how much more atrocities Russia would commit uh, to try to break Ukraine. Uh, and that raises the possibility of a much more horrible conflict ahead unless Putin is stopped, which is, I think, a wonderful uh, idea to do. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Fantastic. Uh, next up, we have Theodore Gerber from University of Wisconsin Madison, childbearing, marriage, and daily life in the NGCA insights from folks. Well, thanks. So, um, 
Uh, my uh, research or the research I'm presenting today is a uh, qualitative research uh, based on virtual focus groups that my colleagues and I conducted um, in Donetsk in uh, July of 2021. And so just a brief background, we, uh, we were intending to conduct research, uh, qualitative research about attitudes towards fertility, marriage, I mean, my colleagues are demographers, family demographers. So that was the basic thrust of the project. We we're supposed to do travel to Ukraine and conduct focus groups there on those topics in 2020, but uh, as a result of COVID, we we're not able to do so. Eventually we converted our format to virtual focus groups. Um, and we, uh, we also decided to, because of the virtual format, uh, do some collect do four focus groups in Donetsk. And uh, so I think, you know, to, to, to kind of frame uh, what we found, uh, it's important to think of how Donetsk has been studied by most observers since the 2014 uh, war there. And that is, uh, it, it's, it's both, by, both researchers and also politicians frame Donetsk in terms of who do they support, what nationality, national groups are they part of, what linguistic groups are part of, and what does that imply for their political loyalties? Are they, do they support democracy or not? Do they support Russia? Do they support Ukraine? Do they want independence? And there have been a lot of, there, not enough, there have been a number of uh, recent survey efforts, including uh, some very good ones, which have asked these questions and probed uh, using uh, you know, remote survey approaches. But uh, what I, I would say the overall gist of our findings, so, so we ask questions focused more on daily life, more on uh, things like marriage practices, dating practices of young people, attitudes towards giving, uh, to raising children, how many children are people should have or people plan to have. And you know, overall what we found is that, so, so I'll, I'll say a bit about you know, the substance of what we found in terms of the daily life concerns. But the message, the takeaway message that I want to emphasize is that it's important to keep in mind that uh, people on the ground in these kinds of conflicts don't always frame their experiences of their situation in po explicitly political terms. They want to live their lives. They want to be free from you know, uh, external shocks that make their living their lives more difficult. And uh, they don't, that doesn't necessarily align with a particular political perspective as conventionally understood. So we think, although of course it's important to study uh, the political orientations of populations um, in areas like uh, Don, Don, the Donbass and other foreign or other frozen conflict zones. And it will certainly be important to study uh, political orientations in Ukraine uh, after the end of the war. It's also important for social scientists to remember that uh, ordinary people often don't immediately think in terms of politics well, and when they're thinking about you know, their lives and what's important to them. So what do we find? So we asked our, our response, we had four focus groups divided by gender, two male, two female. Uh, uh, Keys, uh, the Key International Institute of Sociology assisted us in setting up groups and, and moderating them. And we observed remotely uh, through Zoom, uh, which you know, everybody is now accustomed to doing these days. And we asked them about the main problems they face in their daily lives, about their attitudes towards marriage in childbirth, and also how the conflict, as they refer to it, they mostly refer to the 2014 events as the conflict, uh, how that influenced uh, their experience. And what we found is, um, not surprisingly, they reported a lot of sort of quotidian, standard kinds of grievances and, and complaints about economic issues, mainly focused around low wages, not so much lack of employment. So nobody said that there weren't any jobs in Donetsk. They said that the, there were just uh, no good paying jobs. And they, you know, they, they had miserly income. Uh, the costs of uh, food and services were increasing. It was very hard for them to make ends meet. So now you can see focus groups absolutely everywhere in the world. There's just no place in modern human societies where people don't complain about economic issues. But of course, they also had some more specific complaints that were, you know, that, that were particular to the post-conflict situation in which they live. And so, for example, many of them did report uh, lingering effects of trauma from having been exposed to bombardments and shooting and shelling attacks. Some still, you know, occasionally, especially those who lived on the outskirts of the, the city, uh, not so much in the, in the center of it, they, they reported still hearing shooting occasionally. And they, they, you know, said things like they and their children would still wake up in the middle of the night in terror. And also they, they but they said generally the initial uh, experiences of absolute trauma and fear in the you know, 2014, 2015, 2016, they gave way to more sort of a lingering sense of uncertainty about what tomorrow would bring. And they linked this themselves directly to the experience of having been, you know, having witnessed shells exploding nearby and how that just sort of shattered their sense of, you know, of security in the world. It made them feel insecure and uncertain. 
Uh, they talked about, they complained a lot about uh, disruptions in their lives due to ever evolving demands for different documents on the part of the local authorities, on the part of the Ukrainian authorities for travel purpose. Um, and, and it was a huge headache for them to get these documents because the local authorities were very slow in providing them. They complained about corruption in terms of trying to, uh, having to pay bribes in order to get, even to do things like register the birth of their children, to register for, pay, uh, to, for education, uh, to uh, register marriages, uh, to renew passports. So that was a huge problem. They complained a lot about uh, uh, being cut off from family members who were outside uh, the, the, the line of contact. And, and you know, for various reasons, it was very hard for them to travel uh, to, to maintain contact. So also, in general, apart from family members, the difficulties of traveling uh, to government-controlled Ukraine uh, were very substantial, and uh, most of these people, you know, they had been accustomed to traveling there, and so they were very unhappy about not being able to. They talked about how they had to go through Russia to get into <laughs> Ukraine. Um, they complained a lot about, or they, they observed uh, with, with uh, sadness, the departure, the emigration of many people from Donetsk and from uh, the, the region in, generally, uh, in general, and they, they said that the biggest ways of migration happened right at the time of the conflict, and that some people had actually come back uh, including some who were in the groups themselves. So some of them had, had worked in Russia, a few had worked in, in uh, uh, government-controlled Ukraine, um, and they, um, they, but, but they lamented the fact that it, for them, it was really the best and brightest, the young people, the most energetic elements, the most highly educated, those with resources who had left, leaving behind uh, the elderly young, uh, people who, were, who couldn't leave because of young children. And they perceived that this was a real cost to uh, the, the future of the region that uh, they wouldn't, uh, the region wouldn't have the chance to develop and grow uh, because of this external migration. Uh, so that there was, there were a few sort of positive signs and or hints at least of a more uh, positive outlook uh, in, in our groups that, that people talked about. So, so they did. We asked them about children, about marriage, about things like that. They said, well, uh, they, there are actually more children being born. They also said, well, I know two people who just had their second kid, and we see a lot of children running around. So these are not social scientists, but you know, we thought this would give us a window into how they're perceiving things. And by and large, they, they sense that fertility had been on the increase in recent years based on their personal circles and their observations. In terms of uh, young people meeting each other, they, they said that, well, most people meet online these days, but there's still some traditional dating taking place. So really, there was a, a, a similarity, a resemblance to what you would find in other settings. Um, also, with respect to marriage and childbearing, you know, that we had wide range discussions of why people want to have, should have kids, why they shouldn't have kids, you know, why they're not having kids, why they are, that, that are very uh, parallel to the, the range of opinions about these topics that we uh, picked up in, in other types of groups. And so uh, also then there was a sense that, oh, so recently curfews, another complaint that they had were curfews uh, that, that they were, were imposed on them, so they, that limited social life. And they said that the curfews have recently been lifted. They could now uh, go out on weekends, and, and the things were starting to pick up in downtown, so they're seeing more things. So despite all these signs of optimism, there was also, uh, by and large, the dominant sense in the all four groups was one of tremendous despair, a sense that Don, uh, Don, Donetsk had once been a great city. They hosted Euro Cup matches as, as recently as 2012. It was a thriving you know, industrial center, and all that had been destroyed. There was a sense that they, the region had been left behind both Russia and Ukraine, and they, and they cited very concrete kinds of examples of this, such as the lack of bank cards, the lack of electronic banking uh, services, which they had personally observed work both in Ukraine and in Russia. And so they really felt that you know, the, the rest of the world is moving forward and we're being stuck behind here. And it's just, it's a miserable thing. So above all, what we thought was perhaps a, a more interesting than all this, which is you know, perhaps interesting, not perhaps all, none of it is all that surprising. But what is interesting is how none of them at any point talked at all about political allegiances, political affiliations, nationalist ideas. None of them said, oh, we really want to be part of Russia. Oh, we really want to be part of Ukraine. Oh, we really want to be independent. You know, there were some complaints about uh, the, the impact of the conflict, but that was always uh, it was always framed in terms of this, these external things happened to them. There was no attribution. It wasn't like, oh, the Ukrainian army bombed us or the Russian, you know, the separatists came and took over. It was this stuff happened, this stuff happened. We had to respond and adapt to it. And so I think this is important for us to all keep in mind because, uh, of course, you know, naturally, a lot of the discussion about the current 
uh, war about Russia's invasion is framed around, you know, frames this is, is a battle of democracy versus authoritarianism, of Russia versus Ukraine, of, you know, the geopolitical concerns. And of course, those are important. I don't want to say it's be interpreted in any way saying that those are not important issues. But at the same time, if our focus groups are at all representative, and that we simply can't say based on the nature of data collection, also the special, uh, you know, the special situation in Donbass, uh, if that is the case, and we would expect other people today are not, who are, you know, victims of this war, are not necessarily thinking of it, uh, at least not solely in terms of these uh, larger political or nationalistic questions. They are just people who want to live their lives and are being prevented of doing so, from doing so by these external forces that, um, you know, they can't control. Please. Thank you very much. Next up, we have a, a virtual talk from Uyana Mochan from Karazin Kharkiv National University. Decentralization reform in Ukraine and its consequences on civil response in the face of war. Okay. Uh, good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure to present uh, today here in this conference. Uh, and um, as it mentioned, uh, I would talk uh, about the sterilization reform in Ukraine and its consequence on civil response. The war in Ukraine surprised the world uh, about how Ukrainians resist uh, the war. Mm -hmm. One uh, of the reasons why Ukrainians uh, could self-organize themselves so, so efficiently, I believe it's because of the decentralization reform. The decentralization reform that has like, been carried out in Ukraine is considered a successful one, but at the same time, some like uh, of course has some problems and limitation. Mm -hmm. But today, during my talk, uh, I limit myself just to the achievements of the decentralization reform that impacted the civil resistance. Uh, so the centralization process in Ukraine started on April 1st, uh, 2014, when the cabinet of ministers of Ukraine approved the concept of uh, reforming local um, cell government uh, and the uh, uh, organization of territorial authority in Ukraine. If we are talking about the results of the reform, I can name the following. So uh, first, uh, there have been administrative and uh, fiscal decentralization that uh, we call successful. So it means that budgets and financial autonomy help to increase the level of financial support of local budgets and created conditions for motivating local governments to increase the revenue base for local budgets. Uh, second, Achievements, uh, it's like the process of voluntary unification of uh, territorial communities has also contributed to the development of local democracy. So citizens had the opportunity to take uh, an active part in discussion on the format of uh, promising amalgamated territorial communities, their development strategies and uh, uh, ways to optimize uh, social infrastructure. Another advantage of decentralization was the increase in the state's resilience to internal and external challenges through territorial consolidation at the local level. It was possible because the institutional capacity of local governments were increased and also direct interbudgetary relations with amalgamated territorial communities also were established. And that's why like potential centrifugal incentives were minimized due to the smaller scale of um, self-governing units. Also, I would like to mention that before the local election in 2012, local activists were able to be elected to the newly form, formed Communities Council as political parties did not pay much attention to uh, such uh, like uh, councils before, 20, like until uh, 2020. The involvement of citizens in the life of their communities also was facilitated by the creation of such uh, tools of uh, local democracy as electronic petitions and uh, participation budget. 
Another change is uh, that positively affected the political system in a whole and uh, was because of decentralization reform was that uh, local branches of political parties and the direction of their activities become playing an important role as well. So for instance, uh, there were increased intra-party competition and reduced the influence of uh, party functionaries from the central level on uh, local affairs. Also non-parliamentary parties uh, received the levers of influence on the uh, like, uh, nomination and uh, also uh, some uh, like um, political parties uh, tried to uh, involve local uh, civic activists and intellectuals uh, in order to renew the members of parties and increase their own rating. In terms of uh, how decentralization reform uh, affects the civilians' resistance in the current war. I can say um, the following. So decentralization reform has developed their local governments, their local councils, and their heads become independent from regional councils. So even then the territory is occupied, the people are still gathering in peaceful meeting to show their support for Ukraine. That has been happening in different regions across Ukraine in Kharkiv, Kherson, Donetsk regions, and so on. That's why one of the major mistakes the Russian government made was to suppose that if Russia like, took the region councils and regional administration, then other councils administration on this regional territory would surrender before them. But in the end, we can observe like that uh, independence of local communities from the regional centers. Each communities continue to resist uh, as they protect their own from other, like it's like an Ukrainian community. So as in um, this time, the main purpose of the elected representatives of local authorities was to ensure the uh, livelihood of settlement and provide the necessary service to the people. And in wartime, they continue to do so. Uh, so the experience of local self-government in the occupied territories varies. It uh, like depending on whether the Russian troops simply move from the villages, or they can, like uh, or they are just uh, some uh, active hostilities. So the Hromadas on occupied and frontline territories could accumulate resources, and this is also one of the achievements of decentralization reform. For example, one of the Hromada in Chernigiv region faced the impossibility of supplying bread. So the local head had to organize a place for the production of bread. In one of the villages, an old mill was launched, which turned out to be in working order, which was ground on a millstone. And local women found a receipt for bread and baked it. After the logistics were managed, uh, like uh, to deliver this bread to all people across different communities in this Chernigiv region. So, and we can find uh, such examples of how heads, uh, local entrepreneurs, and people work together across different occupied territory, like in different regions, like in the occupied Romadas in Kharkiv region. There are like milk and meat of local farms were delivered uh, for residents for free. Also, the local government representatives and their teams show some kind of uh, effective teamwork to take on the work that is currently needed. For example, the employees of the financial and the land departments, where the work loads has decreased, started, to, for example, to register the interim displaced persons. And uh, so, Romadas who are not on the front line zone. With the support of local governments, created some centers for internally displaced persons and humanitarian hubs. So they created the transit hubs for people who are going from the eastern to western Ukraine, for example. Also, they have gathered the humanitarian aid for people in eastern Ukraine, and uh, for example, for families who are seeking shelters, local people prepared the places to sleep, clothes, and food. And in the end, uh, I would like to note that some of the main goals of the decentralization uh, were achieved. Specifically, firstly, Ukrainians become much closer to government, which allowed to increase the capacity of citizens. 
And secondly, resource allocation was improved before the war. That's why it allowed to bring the needs for residents better during the war than it was before 2014. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And our final talk is from Elena Nikolayenka from Fordham University, Gender Outcomes of the Revolution of Dignity and Russia's War on Ukraine. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, and uh, uh, I just wanted to bring uh, your attention to uh, women, um, the role of women and the position of women in contemporary Ukraine. Uh, and uh, women played a very important role during the revolution of dignity. Uh, they participated uh, in uh, anti-Russian mobilization in uh, multiple ways by developing an extensive network of volunteers, designing a wide range of crowdsourcing initiatives, providing pro bono legal aid and medical aid for protesters, um, and also uh, joining self-defense units. And once uh, uh, protests ended and uh, um, Russia's military in intervention started uh, in 2014, uh, many uh, Ukrainian women and men uh, joined the war effort, and uh, some of them became involved in various volunteer initiatives uh, to provide support for the armed forces, uh, while others uh, joined uh, volunteer battalions. So, um, and um, in my project, uh, I'm trying to look uh, at the gender outcomes uh, of the revolution of DDT and also to some extent the ensuing war. So sociologists attempt to distinguish uh, different types of outcomes. Uh, some of them look at uh, political outcomes, and in particular, uh, the degree of women's representation in government. Others focus on economic outcomes uh, of mass mobilization and uh, consider uh, changes in the unemployment rate among men and women, um, gender pay gap, or occupational segregation. Uh, and uh, also, um, it might be already possible to try and engage uh, cultural shifts uh, in the aftermath of uh, women's participation in the revolution and the ongoing war. Uh, so just uh, uh, you know, following up a presentation by a demographer, a sociologist who focuses on demography, I wanted to point out uh, from the very beginning uh, that uh, the population decline in Ukraine uh, has uh, preceded uh, the start of the war. Uh, if you just look at this uh, graph for showing the uh, size of the population, and here just broken down for women and men, uh, you can see uh, that uh, uh, the number of both women and men has been on the, the decline uh, since uh, the early 1990s. And uh, this trend just you know, continued, uh, maybe to some extent accelerated uh, uh, in the aftermath of the war. Uh, the birth rate uh, was mostly down, while the mortality rate was up. <coughs> um, and uh, um, uh, yeah, it just uh, uh, shows uh, 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 some underlying demographic changes in society in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, just uh, focusing on um, politics, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, uh, since 2014, uh, the Ukrainian government uh, introduced several changes in electoral laws. The 2015 law on local elections um, introduced the gender quota. Uh, so political parties were required to, uh, were expected uh, uh, to have uh, at least 30% uh, of um, candidates of a particular gender on a candidate list. Uh, this law was adopted just a few months before the 2015 local elections, uh, and it didn't introduce any sanctions for non-compliance. Uh, that's why not all political parties followed the 
guidelines uh, laid out in the law. Um, but uh, then another law uh, passed in 2020, uh, the electoral code uh, uh, dealt with um, elections at different levels and it raised the gender quota to 40 percent so that uh, out of five candidates uh, two must be of a different gender um, and uh, as you can see over time even preceding the revolution of dignity there was kind of a gradual very gradual increase in the number of women in the national parliament uh, while it's still uh, mostly uh, filed below 10%. Uh, and then a, a dramatic, uh, I think, a difference happened uh, uh, in the 2000, uh, uh, most recent 2019 elections uh, when uh, uh, women uh, uh, received over 20% of representation in the national parliament. Uh, uh, as far as local representation is concerned, uh, the picture is a little bit more mixed uh, because. Uh, uh, the percentage of women uh, in uh, oblast legislatures increased from 12% um, in 2010 to 15% in 2015 and then 27.8% in 2020. Uh, but as far as um, city legislatures are concerned, uh, an increase was much uh, smaller and uh, for village councils, actually women's representation declined. Uh, so there is... Um, so these statistics provide just a very, very crude indicator of women's representation in government. Uh, and uh, it's important also to look at um, the extent to which women actually participate in uh, initiating new legislative uh, initiatives, you know, new laws. Um, and also it's important to keep in mind that uh, some political voices are trying to manipulate electoral rules, electoral laws. Uh, and uh, there were numerous uh, media reports suggesting that just uh, a few months or maybe a year after, for example, the local elections, uh, when political parties initially uh, seem to meet the gender quotas, they just uh, uh, ask, uh, well, ask, uh, force uh, uh, women deputies uh, to step down uh, and to vacate their seats. Uh, and uh, give room for you know, other, uh, often uh, uh, male deputies to take uh, uh, their seats. Um, and uh, in uh, uh, the labor market, uh, according to the official statistics, uh, the unemployment rate is actually lower uh, for man, uh, lower for women than men. Um, although of course it doesn't take into account, you know, um, men's and women's participation in the um, informal economy. Uh, and uh, the gender wage gap remained uh, quite stable over time. I mean, the, you can see some fluctuations, uh, uh, but you know, the range is very, very narrow, you know, and uh, for the most part, uh, uh, women received the 77% of uh, men's wages and only in recent uh, Yes, uh, just before an escalation, you know, in violence, uh, uh, we can see that uh, the wage uh, pay gap uh, decreased uh, um, and uh, it stood at uh, 81% uh, in um, 2021. Uh, and uh, as far as occupational segregation is concerned, I, I just wanted to uh, mention uh, the fact that, of course, it exists uh, uh, and persists in Ukraine uh, and it's most pronounced in the uh, armed forces. Uh, but since the start of the war in 2014, the number of women in um, the armed forces has uh, dramatically increased. It's approximately doubled uh, from um, uh, 16,000 in 2013. Uh, to almost 32,000 uh, in 2020. And uh, women, uh, especially women veterans, uh, were very successful in pressing the Ministry of Defense to expand a list of uh, occupations and positions that became available for women officially so that they can participate uh, uh, in the war, not just as uh, uh, paramedics, uh, uh, but also as uh, you know, snipers uh, um, or um, as um, you know, or others who were actively 
uh, in combat positions and then you know have some benefits uh, um, uh, when they um, uh, become war veterans. Uh, and uh, just uh, to conclude, uh, I know I don't have time to talk uh, much about cultural uh, uh, change in um, Ukrainian society, but I just wanted to illustrate and highlight how the revolution of dignity shaped uh, women's lives and had a biographical change also. Uh, and uh, then in turn, of course, uh, affected women's participation in the war. Uh, so this is just one example of one uh, Marusa Zvira boy that was a, a participant in the revolution of dignity. Uh, and um, in one of the interviews, uh, uh, the Ukrainian journalist, she pointed out how it changed her linguistic uh, habits, uh, how uh, in the wake of her participation in the revolution of dignity, uh, she uh, switched from speaking Russian to speaking Ukrainian, uh, but also uh, 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 later, you know, she was uh, uh, one of the founders uh, of a proving ground, a training ground for Ukrainian soldiers and volunteers who later then uh, went on to fight in Eastern Ukraine. And this proving ground was known as Marusin Polygon, and, you know, she was critical in providing some training for, for soldiers. Uh, uh, Yana Zinkevich uh, was another uh, participant in the Revolution of Dignity, and later uh, she uh, decided to work as a paramedic uh, um, and volunteered in Eastern Ukraine. Uh, and she founded uh, Hospitaliers. Uh, um, if you go on social media, you can find on Facebook uh, the uh, account. Uh, they're still you know, very active, they're raising uh, funds and providing assistance. Uh, for um, people uh, in the country. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, Yulia Payevska, uh, known as a tire, uh, was also um, very um, prominent, uh, very active uh, during the war in the Ukraine. Uh, uh, she set up a paramedics group uh, informally known as Tyra's Angels. And uh, she was um, involved in saving and facilitating uh, the um, evacuation of uh, civilians uh, uh, from Mariupol, and uh, that's why she was kidnapped, and uh, uh, she is now in um, uh, somewhere, you know, in in captivity uh, in in Russia. Um, so just to conclude uh, and to, to have some questions for discussion, I think it's important to reflect on um, uh, indicators of the gender equality and women's empowerment in contemporary Ukraine. Uh, to think uh, how can the structural uh, reforms and changes uh, can be also reinforced uh, with some policies aimed at uh, um, uh, altering, you know, cultural practices and so and uh, you know fostering you know, cultural norms uh, in society that are more supportive of women's empowerment. And of course, you know, for policymakers, uh, it's also critical to think how um, you know women and gender equality can be incorporated into uh, reconstruction plans uh, in the post-war period in Ukraine. Thank you. Great, thank you. And in the spirit of discussion, I'm going to stay right here. And also in the spirit of acknowledging important women, I want to extend my original remarks um, and point out in the audience today, Magdalena Dombinska, who's my co-organizer of the Bear Network from University of Montreal, right over there. And Christina Callas, who led a really important um, uh, workshop that we held at the University of uh, Tartu in Narva. Uh, so thanks to both of you. All right, so on to the discussion, right? So again, the idea of these briefs uh, is to use the insights from social science research to spark discussion, particularly about the current Russian war against Ukraine. So what can we take from this research that's going to help us to understand the roots, the evolution, and the potential outcomes of this conflict? And all of these briefs, they work together pretty well. I mean, they focus on Ukrainian society since the 2013-14 Revolution of Dignity and the Russian military incursion into Crimea and Donbass. So they broadly investigate how Ukrainians viewed and reacted to the ongoing experience of war with Russia. And most importantly, we can uh, draw on their insights to find some implications for how Ukrainians will likely continue to adapt and react to this current full-scale war against Ukraine. 
in short, the papers are very much in dialogue. So I'm going to take them in pairs. I'm going to first look at uh, the Alexeyev and Gerber et al. papers, and then at Mobchan and Nikolaenko, and talk about how they how they work together and in some ways build on each other and in some ways challenge each other. So Misha discusses first how, you know, contrary to typical public opinion patterns during military conflict, Ukrainian support for democracy actually increased since the onset of war in Donbass in 2014, including within the Donbass itself. And he shows how this support also correlated strongly with identifying Russia as the aggressor in the conflict and with national pride. But at the same time, what we see with Ted Gerber's paper on these more recent focus groups in Donetsk, uh, this, is, this gives us a note of caution, right? So, because when unprompted, people aren't talking about politics, they're not talking about nationalism, and they're not necessarily talking about the war writ large. Instead, the dominant feelings that, you know, that he sees in the war zone are things like resignation, uncertainty, you know, and indeed indifference toward the two sides in the conflict. This, this idea that, that something is happening to us. Uh, you know, in general feelings that people lack agency. And that sounds more like what standard theory would expect of public opinion in war. And that, those are the kinds of feelings that are not especially conducive to democracy. So what do we do with these, with these, different, um, with these different takes? I mean, Misha suggested that the pro-democracy results might be a function of the desired geopolitical preferences. Of people in um, of people in Ukraine, and you know you don't mention the EU except in passing, um, but it's certainly possible that the broad identification of Europe with democracy might very well be driving these numbers. And in that sense, democracy and security could be highly intertwined in people's minds and are tied to the EU and to EU membership, maybe as much or more than than NATO and the United States. And again, Mises is rightly asking. How well will these results hold up if Europe and the US disappoint Ukraine, uh, both in terms of military support for the war now or in terms of EU membership and other kinds of geopolitical support later? Um, that is, to what extent is internal Ukrainian support for democracy primarily dependent on what external actors do? And I think we've seen that this is not entirely the case. Um, currently, I mean, Ukraine in many ways right now is leading Europe rather than following. Um, but especially given, given you know, Ted's focus groups, we have to ask how deep these pro-democracy results might be. Are people at all identifying democracy with the Ukrainian state itself? And here we certainly see a gap in support for the idea of democracy versus support for the democratic regime in Ukraine. I mean, political leaders in Ukraine, pretty much all of them, were highly unpopular until quite recently, you know, including Zelensky. And most Ukrainians didn't really view their government, their own government, in a particularly positive light. So you have a massive rally around the flag effect right now, um, in part because of Zelensky's really unexpected brilliance as a war leader, and certainly very much because of the brutality and the senselessness of the Russian invasion. But what's going to be necessary to sustain this? To what extent does Ukraine's democratic future depend not only on defeating Russia militarily, but upon being affirmatively welcomed into European institutions, right? And turning to the second two briefs, Nikolaenko and Movchan both look at institutional reforms in Ukraine after the Russian invasion of Crimea and the Donbass and explore how they've affected Ukrainian politics. So Nikolaenko focuses on gender inclusion and she finds some actually really positive things, finds that women's political representation and labor force participation, especially in the armed forces, has increased since 2014, and that there's been some attitudinal progression as well, though you know, not as much as we might want. Um, and throughout the brief, I, uh, uh, you're suggesting that these trends were a result of the, of, uh, the 2014 conflict and the ongoing conflict, and I'd really like to see more concrete evidence about that or discussions about that. What particularly about 2014 began to make the political and institutional situation better for women? Um, you know, was the post-2014, for example, expansion of the armed forces more broadly responsible for increasing women's participation? Uh, was the post-2014 need to introduce new electoral laws or as, as Mochan notes, 
uh, decentralization reforms seen as a, as a positive opportunity to increase the role of women in politics. And on that note, I'd be really interested to hear more from Mo Chan about the roles that women have taken in these decentralized governing, governing bodies. Has decentralization itself provided new opportunities for women in Ukrainian politics? And on the same note, it would also be great to talk about how the full-scale invasion might affect, you know, currently and in the future, women's political positions in Ukraine. Because as we know, typically full-scale war is not great for women's advancement and empowerment, right? Not at all, especially in nationalist contexts. Women become stereotyped as mothers, as victims, as refugees, as a category of people in need of protection rather than political agents in their own right. Um, and now when we do see women as agents, we're often seeing, for example, the sexy sniper photos and the news or on Twitter. Uh, women aren't especially prominent in Zelensky's public facing leadership team. And moreover, you know, women, unlike men, are able to leave Ukraine now. And so we're seeing a demographic change and, and potentially a gendered brain drain. So how can we expect these kinds of gender dynamics to evolve, especially if the war drags on for a long time. And finally, Mochan's fascinating argument that the post-2014 decentralization has provided the political and institutional foundation for local civic resistance to the current Russian invasion is, a, you know, this is especially intriguing. And the brief is at a pretty high level of abstraction. So I'd very much like to hear some specific examples of this phenomenon of work to try to flesh it out. And at the end, uh, Motan argues that decentralization has brought citizens closer to their governments. So bringing this full circle back to uh, the increasing pro-democracy attitudes expressed in Misha Alexeyev's data, to what extent might increasing support for democracy be related to domestic developments like these, as opposed to geopolitical alignments and preferences? And certainly the more that pro-democracy attitudes are rooted in domestic institutions and domestic developments, the more sustainable they're going to be over, over time. And as we know over time as well, <clears throat> war is the greatest test of democracy. So thank you. Let's, let's talk. Thank you very much, Julia. Uh, let's get started with questions from the audience here in person. So I think we have a microphone. If you'd be so kind to introduce yourself before your question. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, so uh, from, I don't know what's best here, uh, Henry Hale um, from GW. So I just have a, a brief, uh, I guess, comment or question for um, each of the, the uh, presenters. And so all, overall, very fascinating. Um, I guess my question for uh, Mikhail Alexeyev is, um, uh just what what do you think the ukrainians in your surveys mean when they think of democracy um and is that changing it as a result of the war is it becoming something like resistance to russia is itself a form of democracy because it reflects the people's will um how liberal is this conception um do, do you have a sense of how that might be changing with the war as well um for uh, uh ted gerber and, and his colleagues um I guess my question just is, uh, you know, to what extent do you, you know, would you factor in questions of, um, I guess, sensitivities, political sensitivities and social sensitivities, uh, you know, of your respondents when talking to you over, um, you know, video, which presumably could be monitored in a very authoritarian environment at war. Um, you know, it seems like, of course, they would avoid politics, uh, but I wonder, you know, if you get a sense of kind of uh, whether there was something unnatural about the way they were responding in that way, or um, you know, just how you might take in, that into account. Um, then for uh, Uliana, um, also really interesting, and um, I guess just uh, you know, it's, it, I wonder what you think about this observation, which may or may not be true. Which is, I mean, I think oftentimes decentralization is resisted. Uh, for potentially weakening the nation, right? It's somehow seen as potentially weakening national unity, um, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and therefore weakening it in the face of threat, whereas what you're showing is, in fact, it seems to have increased it 
or at least increase the effectiveness of Ukrainians uh, defending in a unified way um, their country against uh, aggression. So I just wonder if you might reflect a little more on the broader implications of kind of how decentralization, you know, devolving authority from a central authority to a, a, a local level one you know, on a broad scale, um, you know, might have this kind of almost paradoxical effect of, of strengthening national unity. Um, and whether that whether the war might change this ironically, I mean, because war off also tends to bring um, uh, pressures for unity and imposed centralization. Um, and then finally for uh, Elena, um, I was just curious if you could, I mean, I, I know I know your, uh, your brief and comments are, reflect, are, are focused mo more on um, kind of more, I guess, kind of individual level or micro level, but I guess wonder, I'm wondering about how Ukraine's kind of top level uh, female uh, politicians have navigated these different gender dynamics, especially after 2014. I mean, people like Timoshenko, but but not only. I wonder, you know, if you could just reflect a little bit on that. So thank you. Thanks. So why don't we take them in the order received? And then we can take another question from the audience. And then I have a couple here in the camera. Would like to go first? Oh. No, we are not going. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Juliet, for bringing this. I like how you put it, the affirmatively welcome into the European Union. And I think actually, um, if you look at a couple of prior memos that I, that I wrote for Polnas based on this research, one of the conclusions was that um, maybe one of the uh, problems with the EU policy overall toward the region is that um, it, it's not kind of looking proactively at the effects of the EU joining because uh, having visited, for example, Bucharest and then going to Kiev, you wonder why you know, Romania is in the EU and Ukraine is not. You know? And you also think of cases like Poland and other countries when they, after they were admitted in the EU, they made a lot more progress uh, in, in terms of institutions and the economy. Of course, now there's some backsliding related to other issues, right? But, and, and so uh, I think also in that regard, the fact that Ukraine filed that emergency um, application to the EU is very important. And I think it's very important to keep it going and support it in every way and to move it along uh, because, you know, um, it, it does, uh, it, it would strengthen that kind of, I think, democratic resolve in Ukraine tremendously. And so that, that's a very important, the kind of the, the putting the cart before the horse. Um, and I also, um, to that, you know, one thing I remember in the early 2000s, uh, the largest number of applicants to my university's grad, my department's grad program was actually from Turkey. And we had all these students from Turkey who wanted to write, did, you know, thesis and do research on uh, can Turkey join the EU and what kind of effects it would have. And then, of course, the EU dragged its feet on Turkey. And now we have Erdogan with his kind of oppressive regime. My colleague is actually a Turkish guy, Professor Ahmed Kuru. And I asked him, do you think Erdogan and his crackdown and, and uh, authoritarian turn would happen if, if Turkey were admitted into the EU? And he said, oh, no, absolutely not. <laughs> you know, so there is, there is that kind of threat, of course, long term. Henry, uh, great question. I, I think actually, um, if, you, if, you, if you look at even like Euromaidan and what people were saying about resisting Russia, there's, there's this uh, component, the geopolitical component, I think, to understanding democracy. It's hard to tease it out specifically with, with some kind of, you know, survey data. The only um, more or less clear cut uh, parallel indicator that I have that, that may kind of disassociate those things is the question on whether freedom of the press without fear of repression is important to you. And these two measures basically parallel each other. So I, I think that, um, you know, in terms of kind of endogeneity and other problems, it, 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 may, it may actually reflect more of the genuine um, support for democratic values uh, and, and the Russian aggression and uh, national pride and, and perceptions of NATO EU membership, uh, uh, they're, they're kind of correlates to that. So uh, I think 
uh, but but I, um, I I agree that there is uh, that, that that is potentially a great question uh, to answer. But there is no question to say like how what do you understand by uh, the term democracy? You know? Yes. Uh, well, well, thanks, Henry. I mean, for raising you know what is of course a very uh, serious and important question. So, so uh, the the implication of Henry's question is that perhaps the response of the focus groups, you know, they did hold, have very strongly held political beliefs, you know, in, in speaking terms, but they were afraid to express them uh, because uh, they might face repercussions uh, from local authorities or because they knew that they were being asked these questions by Kiev, basically the Kiev International Institute of Sociology. So maybe if they were pro-Russian, they didn't want to express that to Kiev-based researchers. And they also, you know, may have been uh, concerned about what the others in the group thought about them. So uh, we, we, we thought about this and, uh, you know, while, you know, there, there's certainly no way to definitively answer this question, um, a, a couple of considerations. So, so first of all, um, you know, virtual focus groups are kind of new. And um, I was initially a little bit, or we were initially a little bit skeptical. I mean, basically, we were faced with either giving back the grant to the donor or doing the virtual focus groups. So we said, oh, let's try it. And uh, I was actually surprised um, just on a sort of um, visceral level. I mean, I've, I've done many focus groups in Russia and Ukraine, and even in Azerbaijan. I had some adventures there. And um, uh, Kyrgyzstan. And, and I was actually surprised at how at ease uh, the respondents quickly, or the informants quickly, uh, became at least uh, perceptually. And uh, one of the interesting things about it was the ability in this virtual con, when you're looking at people's faces on the screen, you can see their reactions to what each other is seeing immediately all at once. And whereas, you know, inevitably when you're observing a focus group of people in a circle, some of the people by you know have to be uh, their backs are turned to you, so you can only observe some reactions. And, and they were also, it was interesting, a lot of them were just in their kitchens or the living room. Some, some people were in their cars I mean, or some in their courtyards. And, and so you also sort of got a window into these people's like lived environments in a way you can't get when you put people in a studio and, and ask them questions. And so there were actually some aspects of this that I thought set people more at ease. Now, of course, you know, it was a virtual thing. So there were some occasional technical difficulties. There, there were, there's one person, in fact, in one of these male groups we did who, you know, when the group started them, he, you know, they, uh, we, uh, the moderator asked him, well, so what are you mean? He's like, everything's absolutely fine with me and I know what's going on. He left. And so, so that was clearly a case of somebody who did, was nervous or suspicious about the motives, but everybody else just kind of laughs and say, oh, whatever, you know, uh, that, that was funny. Um, and that was the only case we had. And we, so we did 16 groups overall, you know, 12 with, with IDPs or with local residents in Mariupol and Kharkiv. Um, but um, all right, so, so with this specific question, they did talk occasionally about uh, the you know, Ukraine versus Russia and they, 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 in several contexts. So first of all, a lot of them recounted episodes of people who had migrated to either Ukraine or to Russia. You know, they, they just said Ukraine. They didn't say government control of Ukraine. To them, like they weren't living in Ukraine. So that, that was clear. They, they talked to Ukraine as if they, people left to go to Ukraine. Um, uh, and, and they, but they talked about the decision to go to either Ukraine or to Russia um, on the part of themselves and the part of us in purely pragmatic ways. You know, so oh, so, so you know, they wanted to, they pro-Ukraine, so they, they said, oh, they had a, a job in Ukraine, or they had a job in Russia, or they, somebody suggested, you know, or they had spent time in, they got their education in Russia, so they went there. It was a very practical framing of these decisions, where that particular topic would have, one would think, you know, been, been one where they could have, you know, expressed some kind of a political uh, consideration. Uh, secondly, we asked them about the effect of the conflict on families. So they talked a lot about being separated from relatives, about uh, the, the, that kind of issue. But some of them did talk about political conflicts among spouses, uh, between children and parents. Um, but they discussed this as kind of a very neutral way. They didn't, you know, they, they didn't evince any sympathy for one side or the other. They just sort of thought of the, discussed these kinds of conflicts as cases of, well, you know, people have political disagreements, they fought, sometimes they broke up. And in some cases, they said, actually, you know, they, they personally talked about their own views. They said, well, me and my husband, you know, we fought, we, we disagreed about this, but quickly we realized we were going to disagree. So we, and we just decided it was more important for us to focus on how we can survive as a couple. How can we support each other as a family? How we can get through it? So, so we just decided, you know, we're just not going to talk about this. So I don't know. I mean, yes, of course it is possible that there are these deeply held, you know, strongly felt political views that were just suppressed 
in the context of the conversation, but there was nothing about the discussions to lead me to believe that that was really what was going on. And finally, I'll note that, that one of, I think of the most interesting findings of the recent poll reported by uh, the a team uh, with, of um, Toll and uh, Olaf and, and uh, Sasa, where they've been polling in Donbass, is, is they found a huge, huge variation in the political responses based on whether the respondents were called from Kiev or from Moscow. And basically, if they're called from Kiev, like almost nobody wanted to join Russia or be independent. If they called from Moscow, almost everybody wanted to be independent or join Moscow. I don't remember the exact numbers, but so that suggests that if there is social desirability bias, it's also going to be very strongly felt uh, in, the, in the context of political questions, perhaps more so than the, the, in the context of the questions that we were asked. <laughs> Can we move to Oyana? Yeah. Okay. Oyana. Yeah. Um, uh, so about uh, like uh, why decentralization reform? Yes, uh, has not just like weakening national unity, but we are now observing some uh, united uh, like uh, among Ukrainians. Uh, so. I think uh, it's because like this realization reform is really like something like unfinished yet. Uh, so we have just some administrative uh, decentralization uh, and uh, fiscal decentralization. Yes, and uh, so uh, due to this, like for example, like fiscal administrative decentralization, uh, we the, like resource allocation and logistics uh, were improved uh, like before the war. And uh, so now they just even like um, occupied Gromadas and the heads of that Gromada use the, uh, this like uh, this improvement that we have uh, before. So like people feel their belong belongings like to uh, uh, local level and after to uh, state level. I mean, it's uh, remained at, as it was before uh, because uh, it was like uh, no, uh, regionalization yet. Uh, so that's why we see now this is like um, uh, unitedness among Ukrainians, but I don't see that the exactly decentralization reform uh, like uh, can improve or help to, or so ever, I mean, uh, and uh, influence this uh, uh, like uh, some, some kind of nation building uh, it, as we can call this process uh, like this. I mean, uh, decentralization reform, as like from uh, my point of view, it just like helps uh, to organize uh, inside like uh, small communities better. I mean, to resist uh, this war, not um, among as we see like uh, all Ukrainians resist the war, but just on like some small hermanas and uh, communities and how they can help each other. I mean, and that's why that, like, uh, how the civilization form impacts their systems. Thank you very much. And Oriana? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jerry and Henry, for your comments. I think there is a, a universal trend where, uh, in general, women have a higher chance of being represented in lower levels of government than in the national parliament. And to some extent, you know, Ukraine is obviously not unique in this regard. Um, and uh, 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 at the same time, I think that uh, yeah, as a result of the 2015 local elections, uh, there were some provinces, some oblasts in Ukraine, in eastern Ukraine, uh, that where women received actually greater representation than in some western oblasts uh, that were less affected, I mean, by um, the, the violent uh, conflict. Uh, so uh, uh in some ways uh, in, in under some conditions uh, the war created more opportunities for women to get involved in local politics because uh, the, the, the some men left or there was a short uh, uh, lower involvement of men um in the, in the, uh, in local politics at that time uh, and of course you know i focused in my discussion just on um, official statistics and the women's representation in government uh, but what I left out was uh, uh, women's uh, um, active involvement in civil society and volunteering. And I think women really played a leadership role and um, spearheaded numerous uh, volunteering initiatives uh, um, uh, since 2014, uh, where they 
uh, raise the funds for the army, especially uh, at the very beginning of the conflict, uh, you know, in Eastern Ukraine. Um, and uh, they all continue to be um, actively involved in various um, initiatives now. Um, and uh, um, yeah, uh, uh, and this, so, so to some extent, yeah, decentralization might provide uh, women with uh, great opportunities for involvement in local politics. Uh, um, and uh, I think that uh, as a result of the revolution and the war, um, you know, it, it, it has, um, um, it affected uh, uh, some changes in the party system, uh, because we can see uh, the decline, the demise of some political parties and the emergence of new ones after the erosion of dignity. Um, um, you know, Svetoslav Vakarchuk, a well-known rock musician, created the political party Golos, Voice. Uh, in the wake uh, uh, of the Your Maidan, it received uh, representation in the national government and uh, the national parliament. And after uh, his very Kind of short uh, second stint in the parliament, he stepped down again, uh, and um, uh, the party leader became a woman. So it's I think one of the few cases when um, uh, head of the political party became a woman. Um, Timoshenko, Julia Timoshenko has a very um, contro I mean is a has, is a very controversial figure in Ukrainian politics, to put it mildly. Uh, and uh, even despite the fact uh, that as a woman, uh, being a woman politician, maybe she might have inspired some women to get involved in politics, I, uh, uh, in her position as a party leader, uh, she, uh, uh, most feminists would say, failed to advance the feminist agenda. Uh, she um, um, tried to kind of, in a, in a way, um, reinforce uh, some gender stereotypes rather than break them um, in the way that she, you know, dressed up, you know, uh, and, and, you know, she, her legislative initiatives had very little to do with women's rights or gender equality. She really didn't uh, um, take advantage of her prominent position in Ukrainian politics to advance the feminist agenda. Um, and now I think Irina Verishuk is uh, the most widely seen uh, female politician, um, a government official on uh, Ukrainian media because uh, she um, uh, you know, tries to work uh, closely with different stakeholders uh, uh, to facilitate uh, the evacuation of civilians from um, areas uh, um, and the conflict. Uh, uh, and uh, Irina Venediktova, who is uh, um, uh, who works also with uh, uh, international partners and uh, uh, also local stakeholders uh, to try and uh, you know collect uh, evidence of war crimes. Uh, uh, but uh, um, by and large, uh, you know, on in the public discourse in the media, you mostly see you know male politicians uh, um, discussing. Um, um, what's, what's, uh, what's going on. So yeah, so we have yet to see uh, the long-term effects of the revolution and the war on non-agenda equality in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have a couple of questions from the audience. So uh, let me go. Yes, please. Thank you. That was very interesting uh, discussion, and Julia, thank you for this summary. It actually summed up and uh, linked uh, many of the presentations. I would have two kind of common questions on two issues we raised on, on this panel. And the first one is a question of democracy or uh, how Ukrainians understand the democracy. And since I've been working in Ukraine since 2014, then um, I would like just to comment on this because we have to remember that the revolution of dignity was actually about the revolution about Ukraine in Europe. People were fighting for the idea that Ukraine has to be in Europe. That's how it started. And the whole idea of Ukraine in Europe is something that has been driving the, you know, the idea of democracy. So if we ask whether, how they understand the democracy in Ukraine, I would rather say that first they understand that democracy is something that comes with Europe. And since we want to be in Europe, then that's what we want. Uh, so this is very strong, strongly indeed linked to the idea of Ukraine 
as Europe. And um, my recommendation here is to follow more than we have ever done before also the Ukrainian history of ideas and Ukrainian thinkers, especially Ukrainian writers and philosophers. We haven't paid much attention to, to them. And um, maybe, for example, Volodymyr Yermolenko, the philosopher who has been recently talking a lot about how the whole idea of Ukraine as Europe has been the driving force behind the confrontation with Russia, because Russia has been, as we know, struggling with identifying itself in or out of Europe over the last century. So, so this is the struggle there. And I would say that Ukraine is very clearly um, fighting for itself to be in Europe. And I like very much, Juliet, as you said, the, the quote that um, Ukraine pretty much leads Europe now. And I think uh, this is also a very strong understanding of what's going on uh, in Ukraine right now, because indeed, when we look at any presentation or talk of Zelensky in European parliaments, he tells Europe what you are and what you are fighting for, not the other way around. I mean, he explains to Europeans, listen, you and us together, we are fighting for those values right now. And then the Europe follows and says, indeed, we do. So how can we help you? Uh, so this is exactly what is going on in, in Ukraine right now. And the other idea in Ukraine, which maybe um, uh, we need to explore more, is this fundamental need for freedom. I think the free understanding of freedom in Ukrainian culture is very fundamental. And I think that this is something that political scientists maybe should look more on. And just a last, sorry, last comment regarding the, the women and um, the institutional change, because there were two interesting thoughts here in the panel. Um, Mikhail said that there is a change probably in, in Ukraine that happens that we, that Ukrainians are more rallying around political system rather than a leader, uh, or, or at least we can see the change happening. And this is indeed raises the question for the research of that whether that also means more involvement of women, because we know that if the society is rallying around system rather than a leader, then there is a more window for women to, to participate because single leader systems usually tend to exclude women from the, uh, from the political system. So all these institutional reforms in electoral systems, in party systems, in decentralization have been building the system or the structural system of democracy in Ukraine that has helped to distance from the leader driven politics to the system driven politics. And that has brought more women into Ukrainian politics and have given them more floor. So I think that's something that we need to explore more in case of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Can we take a couple other questions from the audience? Gentlemen in the red tie. Thanks. Uh, my question is for uh, uh, yeah. Uh, my name is Martin Yerushek. I'm currently for right to visitor a researcher here at at the department. Uh, my question is for Uliana. She still can hear us. Not sure. Uh, hi, Uliana. It was nice to see you again after a while. Uh, my question is uh, whether the decentralization. Uh, is being conducted uh, with also with the uh, the topic of uh, pro diplomacy in mind, because given the fact that uh, Ukraine is now uh, clearly headed towards the EU membership at some point in the future, I'm not sure about the timeline, but uh, the pro, pro diplomacy and the relation between individual regions on a sub state level is is a critical part of of, uh, of this. So uh, I was wondering. Uh, whether this is something that uh, was also in the mind of those pushing the the uh, the decentralization in Ukraine. Thank you. Thanks. Let's take one more question for the panel. Uh, my name is Maria Konica, Warwick University. Um, this is briefly probably to, uh, to Dora and to Yana, but maybe to the general panel. Because we keep on talking about democracy and values, but uh, when you speak to a lot of people in Ukraine, they appreciate the military and the arms, and that's all what's going on in their heads. And the longer the time of the war goes, the more it is goes in this direction. And uh, from people who, like me, who have studied wars of earlier, like you have a lot of militarization of societies, not simply that stays on the level of the army, right? And small arms or all kinds of other form. We are like looking at certain tractors dragging, uh, dragging uh, uh, rockets, etc., which is kind of a funny thing on, on Facebook, etc. But the point is that you have a lot of militarization of society. It may have very strong implications on women, on the, the, uh, the localization, because certain parts of the country may become the 
very imbued with, uh, with weapons, would they be really looking into democratic solutions when they have an easier way to go? Um, how would that militarization, probably in the future, probably that's a bigger question, have a way of getting out the weapons uh, or maybe people keeping their hands out of the weapons in the discussion of uh, this democratic, uh, very elevated uh, talks that you have given, but they were mostly about the, the, the values rather than what the arms are and the expectations and the will is uh, from my point of view. Thank you. We have one question from Yoshiko Hara um, for Aliana. Seems like there is a big difference in the percentage of women in the Russian and the Ukrainian armies. Has anyone looked at whether or not the percentage of women in the military is associated with fewer atrocities or what time of year? Um, let's go in reverse order this time. Maybe Aliana, can you lead us off and be if you could be relatively short and you, or pick a couple of questions that you want to respond to because we still have a couple in the audience that wanted to share their thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I haven't looked at the statistics uh, for the percentage of women in uh, the Russian and the Russian army, um, because um, I think that uh, both in Ukraine and Russia, you know, women are not required to serve in the army. So uh, those who join, join on the contract phase. Um, uh, and uh, in Ukraine, uh, there was... Uh, a very um, large increase in the number of women serving in the army um, after you know the start uh, of um, the so-called military operations, or the, uh, after the, uh, the the start of um, the war in eastern Ukraine. So just uh, many women uh, started joining at that time uh, the armed forces, um, and, um, and the number continues to grow. Um, there were most recently some changes uh, where the Ministry of Defense um, broadened uh, the scope of um, professional occupations uh, 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 that uh, um, uh, are needed for the army. So certain so women in certain occupations are expected to uh, be placed uh, on, um, on the registry of the Ministry of Defense so that in case of an emergency, they could be potentially drafted. Um, and uh, as far as the militarization of society, uh, I think to some extent uh, this issue was raised and explored. If you look at some research on the revolution of dignity and the Euromaidan, uh, like Sarah Phillips, for example, has written on uh, the tension between nationalism and feminism and the rise of uh, when um, certain um, um, when squad, women's squads emerged on the Euromaidan. Um, and uh, um, how you know some women try to kind of push back uh, against uh, uh, some patriarchal norms or uh, assume some masculine stereotypical masculine roles, uh, um, but I think uh, it's uh, I don't know it might be too early now to think about um, the, um, the the the. The, the militarization, uh, the effects uh, on, uh, on on the, uh, the, the force, like me, weapons. I don't know. Uh, I, I think right now Ukraine wants more and more weapons <laughs> uh, because just uh, the priority is to uh, yeah to to, to end to, to end uh, uh, to, to defeat uh, uh, the the Russian military. Thank you so much, uh, Ulyana. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, and um, I know that like regions uh, in the EU is like one uh, like and among the like main political actors. Uh, but um, as I mentioned before, the decentralization reform in Ukraine is unfinished uh, and um, like uh, uh, as I know, like among even decision maker, like no understanding about uh, how these like regions inside Ukraine uh, uh, should be look like uh, or so. And uh, even I know that what uh, is now is uh, like considered uh, in Ukraine. It's just about how this like local government uh, could resist the war. Like uh, like uh, what should be like how they could struggle or so and uh, nothing about regions, but I understand that this is really important issue toward uh, our like uh, Ukraine's um, 
implement this uh, all laws uh, regarding uh, entering EU. So, but for now, it's like uh, like um, at least as I know, like nothing toward this like regionalization and all this diplomacy and everything. So thank you. Uh, Ted. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, I, I'll just br br briefly recount one anecdote with respect to arms uh, that uh, one of the respondents in these groups uh, spoke of. So she was talking about uh, the question of you know, bringing children into the world. She said, well, how, how, we, how can people want to bring children into this world where you know, my 12-year-old son is able to, by the sound of an incoming shell, say what type of shell it is, where it's being shot, and where, where it's going to land? Um, and the implication being that, you know, that this just a horrible thing, that the fact that her child has assimilated this military knowledge uh, was very distressing to her. Or rather, or briefly, I would say that, you know, that, that piece of The Economist, which actually referred to, has an amazing um, quote from, from uh, a person who fought in, in uh, one of those units, and, and it shows the uh, incredible pluralism of the Ukrainian military it also shows the difference between the military organization in Ukraine and Russia, how the Ukrainian defense minister actually listens to senior commanders. They communicate with the with people in the field. They, they design very flexible uh, approaches. They, they come from the ground up. So the very military organization, so there is the reverse tendency as well. There is militarization through traumatic experience like, like Ted describes of society and, and basically just the need to survive and self-defense. This is the question you ask in some ways like the first world problem right now, right? The first, the, 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 the real problem is to survive. After that, you know, a lot of other problems can be dealt with. Thank you. I believe we had a couple of questions from that one of them. So Mark, first. <clears throat> So I'm Mark Kramer from Harvard. Um, my uh, questions at first for Misha, my reaction is very similar to Henry's Misha when I was reading your policy brief. I was wondering exactly what people meant by democracy. And I'm thinking, say, of Sam Huntington's definition of um, free and fair elections with sufficient civil liberties needed to carry them out. Um, and in that regard, I think it would be useful if you were to look at how people conceive of, say, the prospect of losing an election and how you respond to that, um, of how they conceive of uh, having a candidate that they despise in office, um, which often happened in Ukraine prior to 2014 on one side or the other, um, how they conceive of civil liberties, for example, can you speak favorably about um, Russia or some other negatively perceived entity. Um, so to break those down and then look, maybe it's the same trends that you describe here, but it would be interesting to see whether it varies for the different components of democracy. Um, for Aliena, um, I found this a very interesting brief in your discussion here as well. And I'm wondering, um, it, especially, I was intrigued that it began before the Euromaidan. And uh, so I, I'm wondering to uh, what you did, whether that goes back to the Orange Revolution or how far back that that goes. Um, and uh, also the rise of Yulia Tymoshenko. And, um, and, um, but uh, the, the, the major point, though, I was wondering is that you can get these periods, um, for example, in Allende's Chile in uh, the early 70s, when there was a rhetorical commitment to the expansion of political participation by women and, and political leadership, but it never really materialized. Um, in fact, if anything, the, the all, almost all of the prominent political leaders during that time on the left were men. Um, and so I'm wondering to what extent that uh, you think that the, the very impressive trend that you're looking at to the, it, maybe it's going to be institutionalized, but is there the prospect it can be reversed as well? 
Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Oh, it's got to be brief because we've got a hard stop in five minutes. Um, Stanley Kober, I'm wondering about the future of Ukrainian society. If this conflict extends for another six months or a year, already 45% of GDP has been lost in just two months. Over 10% of the population has fled the country. You have the internally displaced. At that level of destruction, if this continues for another six months, let alone a year, what will be left of Ukrainian society? Could Ukraine be reconstituted? Thanks. And then one brief question from online about the idea of a distinct Ukrainian feminism and in independence of women to the historical factors in Ukraine from Arthur um, Piotowski, Piotowski. In Russian culture, there appears to be a pretty strong patriarchy. Is this possibly different in Ukraine? Has the role of women evolved between the two societies um, differently? So we have about one minute, and I'm, I mean it, like one minute left before we all get kicked off the stage. So, um, Mikhail, let's go in reverse order if you want to respond to anything, but I will intervene. <laughs> yeah, I'll just very quickly say, you know, Mark, thank you very much. Actually, uh, in conceiving the project and looking at these things, I tried to, my, my first temptation was to do exactly what you ask. And I looked at a lot of these measures, uh, a lot of them track with this. But then, you know, I, there's another interesting thing. If legitimacy of democracy uh, is important for survival of democratic regimes, which is Lipset's argument, uh, some of the recent studies actually tested that empirically in 135 countries with uh, survey data and uh, data on rating of democratic regimes. And you basically see uh, precisely on the question of what measure of democracy is the most appropriate in surveys, which measure of democracy correlates with the actual development of democracy. The interesting thing is the very general questions, like is democracy better than other systems or you know, that don't unpack the notion they correlate the most with the survival of democracy across the world. So uh, there's something to the general question being asked. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'll see my 15 seconds to and then Uliana. Great, let's go to Uliana then with final thoughts. Do you have any? Okay, yeah, I uh, uh, I just want to. Uh... Sure, go ahead, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, okay, so you can hear me, it's okay, I mean. Uh, I just um, want uh, to thank uh, about like uh, all uh, comments uh, and uh, of course uh, what uh, we are researching now it's like ongoing yes because the uh, war like uh, is not ended and Ukrainians has not won yet uh, but we just hope uh, and uh, everything that we now are talking about is like uh, some kind of optimism yes uh, that ukraine will uh, rebuild that we now see they sound like uh, united uh, across like uh, ukraine and uh, like uh, no authoritarian um, uh, like regime is now and uh, something like um, i mean uh, and and no like possibilities uh, for that uh, so everything that they have is like some hope and uh, some like uh, democratic uh, issues that uh, we uh, have like right now inside ukrainian societies thank you, thank you very much and elena last word with you uh, thank you and uh, i just want to use my one minute to build a bridge to the next uh, talk uh, that we're going to hear at 11. Um, so I'll bring up um, Belarusian women and draw some comparison between Belarus and Ukraine. Uh, I think that if you look at the just uh, statistics uh, for women's representation in the national parliament, Belarus uh, is far ahead of Ukraine. Um, and uh, that's why I wanted to warn you that, you know, just looking at, and I pointed out in my presentation that uh, just uh, looking at the statistics, uh, um, um, is a, a very, very crude uh, and sometimes misleading uh, indicator of women's empowerment uh, because uh, president or, uh, or, you know, the, uh, the, inc well, the, 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 the ruler of uh, Belarus, um, uh, to be more precise, uh, Alexander Lukashenko, uh, has uh, deliberately uh, uh, tried to uh, increase the, the share of women's representation in the national parliament. And obviously uh, he, did, he was not thinking about uh, 
uh, democracy or women's empowerment. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, in one of his uh, speeches, he even suggested uh, that uh, uh, this is a way for him to uh, create a more kind of compliant uh, parliament uh, because he assumed uh, that uh, uh, women would be more um, vulnerable to political pressure that uh, he, he can uh, or his uh, um, coercive apparatus uh, can um, carry out. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we have yes. to move on to it. Yeah. So nonetheless, not yeah, just, you know, I, I mean, uh, speaking of women in higher positions of power, you know, Svetlana Tikhanovska is just another example of how women uh, in such, uh, uh, how it, it was uh, under certain circumstances, uh, uh, the closure in political opportunities uh, can create an opportunity for women to rise. We've seen it in the past in communist Poland, where the Polish solidarity movement uh, experienced uh, a large number of arrests of male politicians and women uh, assumed a more prominent role. And I think the same can be observed in uh, uh, contemporary Belarus, where, uh, especially in, in 2020, during the elections, when a lot of male politicians were arrested, which uh, uh, created an opportunity for women to take the center stage. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the panelists and to the audience. Look forward to the uh, the next talk, which will start in about 10 minutes, right?